Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from today. A very warm welcome and thank you from Welthorse Welfare and the Donkey Sanctuary for joining us today during Climate Week, where we explore the importance and contribution of working animals when devising climate change adaption and mitigation plans, especially with a particular focus on the impact of environmental related disasters in mountain areas. Now, over the next two hours, we hope this is going to be a very interactive session. So to get that ball rolling, we're going to start off with a poll question. A very simple poll question to ask just to see, get a feel for the, uh, for the cross section that we have with us today. To what sector does your organisation belong? And we've got a series of options. I hope m most of you will fit into one of them, but there is the other option if, if none of those are suitable. So whilst you're focusing on that, not many people realise that mountain ranges or regions occupy over a quarter of the world's landscape and contribute to the livelihoods of nearly one billion people. Mountain terrain, as we know, can be largely inaccessible to motorised transport. So working animals have done and will certainly continue to do so play a vital role. We have a number of wonderful speakers to explore this topic today. And so if you want to ask a question during today's session, then on the Zoom function um, at the bottom of your screen, if you just uh, hover your mouse over the screen, is a Q&A function. So what would be really helpful is if you could place concise questions in the Q&A function and ideally which panellist you were asking a question to. But there's also the chat function as well. So if you just want to interact with uh, other panellists or indeed everyone who's with us today, then please use chat function. But if you could reserve questions for the Q&A tab, that would be really, really helpful. This event will be recorded and will be available on the YouTube account for the World, uh, uh, the Working Animal Alliance channel, sorry. Um, and so please do, if, uh, if you find today useful, refer back to it, but also refer your colleagues and friends to it as well. Now, hopefully we've been able to get a bit of a response to our poll question. So just to get a feel for who is out there, um, here, here are the answers. So we've got, wonderfully, a really good spread. Most people from NGOs, but a good split from the UN agencies, government departments, a, a little bit from veterinary practice, and a strong showing from academia. So thank you very much for interacting in that. And now, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our first speaker, Yuka Makino, who is serious, a senior forestry officer and team leader for the Water and Mountain Unit at the FAO. Yuka has had several uh, field roles during her career in Nepal, in Cambodia, in Bangladesh, in Japan, uh, and has a very good understanding globally. So Yuka, you're very welcome and over to you. Thank you, Chair. Before I begin, I would first like to thank the Donkey Sanctuary and the organizers for inviting me and the Mountain Partnership to this exciting event focusing on the importance of working animals for the livelihoods of the mountain people. My, let me first share my screen with you. I hope you can see my screen now. Great. So I'm Yuka Makino and I work at FAO as the chair has introduced me. What I wanna first focus on is that as you know, there's 17 SDG goals and the foundation for these SDG goals are the four key natural resource SDGs, the life below water, life on land, climate action, and clean water and sanitation. And I believe these four are the foundation. And without this, our society, our sustainable economic development, food, health, energy won't survive. And mountain ecosystems falls under SDG 15.4.2. So that's how important mountains are. So why do mountains fall matter? It covers 27% of the Earth's land surface. It's home to 15% of the global population. That means 1.1 billion people. 
It provides 60 to 80% of global fresh water, a lot of the water all of us drink. It hosts half the world's biodiversity hotspot, half. And it attracts 15 to 20% of global tourism. Yet, one in two rural mountain people living in developing countries face hunger and malnutrition. One in two. So where do I come from? I would like to take this opportunity to introduce what we are, the Mountain Partnership. We're made up of 402 members. We're the only United Nations Voluntary Alliance of Partners dedicated to improving the lives of mountain people, protecting mountain environments around the world. We're composed of 60 governments, eight subnational authorities, 18 IGOs, 20 global major groups, 296 civil society organizations globally. We're hosted by the resolution of the United Nations Secretary General in FAO, and we're supported by Andorra, Italy, and Switzerland. So what are the climate-related challenges that are faced in mountains? As I mentioned earlier, we, the mountains, are the key suppliers of fresh water on the globe. Yet the glaciers are melting due to climate change, and there's been drastic changes in the water flow. There's been an increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme events. You may have heard of glacial lake outburst floods. There are landslides due to cloud bursts. There are increased avalanches, flooding, and drought. It goes both ways, from floods to drought. And then there's biodiversity loss of land degradation due to unplanned, uncontrolled land change and land use change, as well as uncontrolled tourism. And there's actually been an increase in food insecurity from 2012 to 2017. This year, we'll be, FAO will be publishing a paper, and we, had, we found out that there's been a 12.5% increase of rural mountain people in developing countries vulnerable to food insecurity. And then, because of all of this, there's been an issue of out-migration. So what are the adaptation of strategies that are available for mountain people? One very key thing in the development of mountains is integration of risk and landscape perspective to development. What you think is happening 150 kilometers upstream can affect you living 150 kilometers downstream. Though you might not be able to see the mountains, your life is affected by what's happening upstream. Therefore, we definitely need to apply the landscape perspective. We need to work with the mountain communities to improve their local economies. I will share later about improving the value chain of mountain products. And we need to work with them to make sustainable food systems to address this food insecurity problem and work on developing sustainable tourism in mountain areas. So what is, what do we do at Mountain, Product, uh, mountain Partnership? I wanna share one of the things that we do in helping improving the livelihoods of mountain communities. It's called the Mountain Partnership Products Initiative. As you may know, there's a rising demand for high quality mountain goods. There's also a belief that mountain products are associated with positive values. But what happens is once it reaches the market, you can't distinguish the mountain product with other product. So what have we done? The Mountain Partnership Secretariat, in collaboration with Slow Food International, developed a voluntary labeling scheme to, develop, to benefit small mountain producers. We only have four criteria to qualify for this label. It has to be an altitude, it has to be considered a mountain product. It has to be small scale, so we don't um, go through uh, medium and large scale enterprises. It has to practice sustainable, environmental sustainability and equity. One of the, how we help these mountain communities is fourfold. One, because a lot of the mountains, as you know, mountainous terrain, the, the producers are spread out all over the mountains. So we help them organize in groups and so that we can have a um, substantive production which we can market, that's number one. We help in the packaging so that we can distinguish the packaging of the products of mountains. Number three, we also help in the participatory guarantee system so that there's a guarantee in quality. Number four, we help in the marketing in local, eventually regional, and our dream is global. So far, we've supported 10,000 farmers in 12 countries with 20 products. 
We have worked with 6,000 women, 16 producer organizations. And in the last two years of our program, we have had 49% increase in sales, 40% increase in production, and a 25% increase in price. It's because we're able to fight against fake products. And the last thing we have as a mountain partnership, all of us join together into a partnership because we're calling everyone to action for these four key things. We would like to call for targeted investments in mountains. I've said it before, but also the sustainable production diversification of food systems in mountains to combat this food insecurity and strengthening skills and value chains of the mountain communities. And finally, ensuring that mountain regulations, state policies, all ensure that they have mountain related policies considered in their planning. So do join us in a Mountain Matters movement. Thank you. Yuka, thank you so much for that. That's fascinating. In terms of startling statistics, 12.5% you know, increase in, in those who are at risk of food insecurity in mountainous regions. So, I mean, clearly the, the, the initiative is badly needed. And some, I know we'll have some questions that will come back to that. So if people just remind you, if you have any questions, please uh, go through on that Q&A tab on the Zoom. Uh, platform. So thank you very much for that. Now I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Tamara Tadic, Associate Professor at the University of Chile, who has a doctorate in veterinary science and a wealth of experience and expertise in working horses, donkeys and mules in Chile and beyond. So Tamara, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Good morning uh, or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the um, invitation. And today I want to share with you part of the aims of an ongoing project on the welfare of mules kept by the army here in Chile and how they are becoming an opportunity for a one welfare approach in some areas of the country. First of all, in Latin America, working equids are still very important for the subsistence of many families. And are not only part of their economic capital, but also are part of our cultural capital. Being involved in many types of activities, and not only work, but also some ceremonies, and are considered as part of the families. In the case of Chile, the main working equids are horses and mules. We don't have a big population of donkeys. And mules only reach around 20,000 individuals across the country. For years, mules have been used by muleteers in the Andes, either for carrying different types of goods between communities that are located in the mountains or for moving animals. But every year, there are less mules available, also because the donkey population is very small in the country. During summer, farmers take their animals up to the Andes and stay with them the entire season. This uh, gives them an opportunity to take advantage of the green grass during uh, the summer. And then they come down again in autumn. For this, they use mules, usually more than one mule per person. The army mules are mainly used for military exercises to monitor the frontier with Argentina and in cases of disaster, they are used to access communities in the mountains. Currently, the aim of our project, uh, the aims are to determine the best morphology for this type of path work, but also to estimate the maximum load that they can uh, move to determine some of their physiological responses to this type of exercise and look for signs of pain. And on the other hand, we also want to see how the human-animal relationship can affect their welfare. But at the same time, we're trying to encourage the army um, to have a higher presence within society with their mules. For example, providing mules to communities through their breeding programs or providing support during different situations or needs. For example, today the Army has um, an assisted therapy program, assisted by mules, for children with special needs that wouldn't be able to access this type of therapy otherwise. In 
2017, the Chilean army, together with the Argentinian army, recreated the crossing of the Andes, done by San Martin Anohins in 1817. This is a great example of the capacity of mules to work in this difficult terrain. We are convinced that working equids can help improve the welfare of people by allowing them to reach some of the sustainable development goals. And at the same time, welfare of mules could be improved when uh, we are able to accomplish this goal. And I will just show a couple of examples from Chile. During the SARS, the SARS CoV 2 pandemic, the army mules have been in, in charge of securing food in communities of difficult access. In this photo, you can see mules that are loaded with government boxes that include food and hygiene products that are being distributed during the quarantines when people cannot get out of their communities and they don't have access to local markets. For small farmers, Mules ensure access not only to transport of their goods, for example, to market, but they also are, are a reliable source of sustainable energy and they can use them in different tasks in the farm, like plowing. Another good example of how mules are involved in different activities in Chile is um, with the wine industry. You probably all know that Chile is known because of its wine and it's one of our main exports. So now many vineyards are becoming organic and this implies changing their management practices. This is a, an example of one a vineyard and one type of wine that is called Las Mulas, where motorized vehicles have been a, changed and are replaced by mules during the harvest time in order to have a complete sustainable concept in this one year. Finally, a big part of the tourism in Chile involves activities that are, that are done in the mountains. People like to come to Chile and they like to go up to the Andes and see this, um, this big mountain range. So many people that live in rural communities near the mountains and that usually work as muleteers, activity that is decreasing in the, in the last years. And this has to do with a lot of people wanting to leave these rural areas and move into cities. But uh, some muleteers have seen an opportunity and they can get an extra income by diversifying their activities. And for example, many are now getting involved in tourism activities as guides um, in the Andes. No one knows the area and the way in the mountains better than muleteers. So now they, they can have a sustainable extra income and this is a, we can associate it with the decent work and economic growth in some areas of the country. As final remarks, I would like to point out that Chile has geographical conditions that require the use of working equids and especially the work of mules. And on the other hand, the army has experience in breeding these mules. They have a lot of donkeys that they have brought from France, for example, and it, it, it gives an opportunity for the army and for the country to work together. The army can get involved in more of this societal need by transferring their knowledge, but also providing animals to some of the small communities that are, are now not having access to mules. And this is why we have a need to promote mules welfare. This can be done through research. That, are, that is what we are doing. And this could allow not only improving the selection of mules, their welfare, but it will also improve the welfare of many people that um, depend on their subsistence on, of mules. And also mules uh, are an opportunity for communities to become more resilient to probable disasters that we know that in Chile we have all the time. We have earthquakes, we have, well now the pandemic, we have volcanoes, we have tsunamis. So 
having this opportunity to work with the army could open the doors for a bigger project with small communities in the mountains. And with that, I would like to finish. Thank you very much. Tamara, thank you very much. I, look, I used to be in the British Army and we had a, a pack animal course involving mules. So I looked at your photos there with great, great affection. Um, and um, I couldn't agree, but Paula Sosa says, Tamara is the best on the, on the chat function. So I, could, I couldn't agree more with that. That was a, gr a great insight and wonderful to see the versatility of equines to, to human livelihoods today, uh, but also then to introduce the, 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 their vital role from a working perspective to the Sustainable Development Goal. So, I know we'll we'll certainly come back to that during the discussion. Uh, so thank you so much, Tamara. Now I'd like to uh, introduce to you Zhao Azadido, who's professor at the Polytechnic Institute of Braganza in, and a researcher at the Mountain Research Centre in Portugal, who will discuss the European context. So Zhao, over to you. You're on mute, Zhao. Okay, thanks, Rolly. And, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this interesting event. So I'll start sharing my, my screen. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk today about drivers of landscape change in Southern European mountains and how they are affecting the supply and the value of ecosystem services. Uh, as Duca pointed out, mountains are very important all over the world, but also in, in Europe, and in particular in the south of Europe, where they are quite abundant. If you see in this map, the mountain ranges that you can find in the south of Europe, in the Mediterranean area, from the Iberian Peninsula to, to Turkey, which are um, amazing. And they, these mountains, they provide a series of benefit to the to society locally and nationally and regionally and uh, overall and just to give you an example out of this area in portugal 40% um, of the country is considered as mountain areas hosting more than one quarter of the population and all these mountain areas are very important in terms of ecosystem services in general with an emphasis on biodiversity conservation energy production, agriculture, forestry, tourism and recreation, and cultural heritage. And these mountain areas in the south in particular are, are changing very quickly. And one of the, the reasons why they are changing is that they are losing population. As Yuka mentioned, that happens in other parts of the world, but here is, is happening at a very, very uh, fast um, rate. Just to give you an example, in the region where I'm talking from, um, population in the last 10 years, population has decreased more than 20% in most of the rural parishes. And the same pattern is observed in interior uh, municipalities of, of the country. And this is a very common thing in mountain areas in Portugal and other parts of, of Europe. And as a result of this, the, the, the population, uh, there's a growing abandonment of um, farming and other activities in, in rural areas, which leads to what is now called rewilding. And rewilding is, is becoming a dominant process in many of the mountain areas in, in the south, not just in the south, but uh, in the south as well. Uh, and you can see here in this map produced by, by colleagues, uh, the expected rewilded areas in Europe by 2030, where there's a, a huge uh, percentage of the land rewilded in, in, like in the north and center of Portugal, as well as in Italy and other countries in, in, in the same region. And this abandonment and um, rewilding causes changes in processes, ecological processes, as well as ecosystem services that I'll address shortly. One of the changes has to do with the, the connectivity of habitat, of natural and semi-natural habitat in these regions. And that uh, makes possible events like the, the appearance of bears, brown bears in the north of Portugal. Brown bears have been away for almost two centuries. The, the species has been extinct in Portugal for one, one century and, and a half and bears are, are back. And this is possible because the, the population in north of Spain in a mountain range in, in Europa is expanding and 
the individuals find their way through this changed landscape, the rewilded landscape. They find their way until places like the north of Portugal. This bear, this is part, this is part of a newspaper that shows that one year ago, uh, a, a bear arriving here in the region, a few miles north from where I'm, I'm talking, and the, the bear stayed just a couple of days, but more bears are expected to arrive in the near future. So you, you can also um, consider that in general, the changes that landscapes are, are showing um, are positive in terms of this concept that now we use, that, that is the ecosystem services concept. Uh, the landscapes are generating um, more and more benefits to, to communities, to the, the society in, in general. These graphs are part of a study that we published in 2016 in Mountain Research and Development Journal, showing that over time from 1990 to 2006 and for the, the near future, the both regulating and provisioning ecosystem services are expected to, to increase in supply and also in, in value, which is a positive thing related to this rewilding and landscape change that is um, occurring in, in these regions. On the other side, uh, we have um, risks that also increase. Fire is, is a major process, is a major risk in the south of Europe, and it's, it's expanding to to other locations is, is affecting also areas in the center and in the north of, of Europe. Uh, but in the south is where you find most of fire events in, in, in the past. Um, combining and fire, this, this uh, growing fire risk is related to changes in the landscape, but it's also related with changes in climate. So when you, you combine climate and landscape change, this is what can happen. This is a picture taken in 2017 in the center of Portugal where big fires uh, and catastrophic destructive fires um, affected the, the region. And more and more fires like these are being seen in other parts of the world, including now the western, western coast of, of United States and Australia before. Uh, so things like these become more and more frequent. And, we, we started studying these processes a few years ago, and this is uh, from a study in 2011 showing that in a, in a small parish north of Braganza, um, there is a trend over time, and this is data from 1958 to 2005, for intensive fires, high or fires of high and extreme intensity. Uh, they, they are expected to increase in time. This high and extreme uh, fire intensity uh, is indicated by, by the, the red colors. Dark red shows extreme intensity fires that tend to increase over, over time. And the same results um, were obtained in a, in a different st study uh, published last year in Ecosystem Services showing that in a, in now in a larger area, fires, wildfires tend to be larger in, in size. Uh, you can look at extremely large fires, which are fires above 2,500 hectares that tend to increase over, over time. And small fires that are indicated with this beige, light beige, tend to decrease over time. And this is only the result of landscape change. And these changes, uh, in fire regime and in fire intensity, fire size, conflict with the provision of ecosystem services. So uh, to summarize, what is happening in these mountain landscapes in the south of Europe is that rural the, popu the population and abandonment are changing landscapes in a positive way. That means that they increase the supply and the value of ecosystem services in these regions, which is, which is good news. Uh, fires becoming more frequent and more intensive as a result of landscape change uh, might affect uh, the supply of ecosystem services and their value, which is indicated here with this, this yellow color. But if we add climate change into the equation, things might be, become catastrophic and wildfires uh, interacting with, with rural the, the population and abandonment might cause uh, dramatic changes in the landscape 
uh, leading to a, a reduction of a serious reduction of the supply and the value of ecosystem services. So this is the, the, the point I wanted to make today. Of course, I'll be available for questions and for debates during the session. Thank you very much for your attention. Zhao, thank you very much for that. Uh, that's quite a sobering uh, view of what's uh, happening and, and, the, and the threats involved in, in climate change. But thank you very much for that. And yeah, uh, there will be plenty of questions of that, I'm sure. Now we go from Europe to Africa, and I'm de delighted to introduce Maureen Anino, who's Principal Environmental Officer at the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda. She's also on, represents Uganda on the steering committee with the Mountain Partnership Forum. Now, um, the internet tr um, troubles are, are slightly challenging at the moment, so um, we have um, Maureen, so I hope we can have a clear signal. Um, and um, Maureen, over to you. Hello? Hello, Maureen. We can hear you. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, thank, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this event. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation, and I hope it's being projected. It is. All right. Uh, Jumbo from Uganda. I'll start with a brief introduction about Uganda. Uganda is a small country in Eastern Africa, with a population of about uh, 46 million, 55% of which is below the age of 14. And you, you can see that we, are one of, we have one of the youngest populations in the world, which plays a big role in climate change. Uh, our average temperature is 25 degrees centigrade, and annual rainfall of between 900 and 1,500 millimeters. But, and because of the beautiful climate, beautiful scenery, Sir Winston Churchill referred to Uganda as the Pearl of Africa. So I'm going to make a presentation today about climate change, climate change mitigation and adaptation in Uganda, specifically for mountain areas. So in Uganda, we have about five major mountains, and most of them are transboundary in nature. And we have one mountain, which is 5,000, about 5,000 meters above sea level. This is one of the highest mountains in Africa. It's called Mount Renzori. It's the third highest in Africa. And then we have four other mountains, which are over 3,000 meters above sea level. And most of these mountains have also been gazetted as protection areas. So why, why do we think mountains are important in Uganda? One, mountains in Uganda are biodiversity hotspots. We are on slide three. Mountains are biodiversity hotspots. Most of our mountains, like I said before, are protection areas. We have one of the few areas in, in, in the world that has the gorillas. That is uh, on Mount Mugahinga, which is in Uganda, the mountain gorillas. Then our mountains are also water towers. Most of the fresh water that we have is from the mountains. Our mountains are also carbon sinks. And our mountains, house about 4 million people in Uganda. So they are, very, they are quite densely populated, and this is partly because of the fertile soils in these mountains. So these mountains, because of the fertile soils, they are also the food baskets of our country. That is where most of the food comes from. Then these mountains, two of them are also home to some of the indigenous tribes, the Ik and the Batwa. And the mountains also have cultural attachments. 
slide number five. So I'll start with the overall strategies on climate change that we have as a country. One, we have um, institutional arrangements for climate change have been put in place. We have a policy committee on environment, which, is, which comprises of the political leadership. This oversees all environment and climate change issues in the country. And it, it, on it, uh, they sit the cabinet minister. Then we also have the National Climate Advisory Committee, which is basically a technical committee to advise on issues of climate change. Uh, the, we also have a ministry, a line ministry, that is responsible for issues of environment and climate change, that is Ministry of Water and Environment. And we have a department which is directly responsible for climate change issues. At all, every level of ministries, every government ministry, department, authority, and the local government, we have climate change focal person right up to the lowest level of the village. We also have the climate change, the parliamentary forum on climate change, which was created in 2008, basically to create and promote awareness on climate change. We also have a robust, a robust legal framework in place, and I'll just highlight a few of these. One of them is Uganda's Vision 2040, which is a 30 year development master plan that recognizes the significance of climate change resources in, in, in driving the country towards middle income status. This vision 2040 also recognizes that climate change is a key to enhancing long-term sustainable economic and social development. We also have a national development plan that recognizes climate change as critical in sustaining sustainable development and in attaining sustainable development in Uganda. We also have a climate change policy and its costed implementation strategy that was enacted in 2015. We have a bill which is in draft form before parliament to be for approval. We also have a national policy for disaster preparedness and management. Uganda as a country also submitted their INDC in 2015 and was among the first African countries to sign the partnership plan for the NDCs in 2018 to achieve the national climate goals as per the obligations in the Paris Agreement. We've also made regional commitments regarding climate change. We have a, a regional climate change policy for East Africa to which we are a member. We are we also made several obligations, international obligations. And we also have several operational and strategic documents to guide the country on climate change. Slide seven. So I'll now talk about the impacts of climate change in mountainous areas in Uganda. Climate change has led to increased frequency in disasters in mountainous areas. Before the year 2005, we did not have very many disasters in the mountainous areas because most of these areas were intact. They were intact, there was no human activity on them. But from 2010, we've had increased cases of flooding, increased cases of landslides, and every year, even right now, it's the rainy season, and two weeks ago, we lost about five people. We lost several properties in uh, one of the mountainous areas, that is Mount Elgon, and also Mount Renzori region. And these have led to increased famine, food insecurity, loss of life. In the year 2010, we lost about 200 people. In 2018, we lost about 50 people in the mountains because of the climate change related uh, hazards. We also have in the mountain areas because of these climate related disasters, there has been increased occurrence of diseases, 
loss of infrastructure, which has led some of these infra infrastructure are hospitals. This has led to increased uh, maternal mortality rates. Schools have been destroyed. Roads have been destroyed. This has led to increased school dropout rates. We also have soil erosion that has affected the productivity in these areas, the productivity of agriculture. We also have an increase of gender-based violence, increase in conflicts, displacement of people and animals. And generally this has resulted into loss of livelihoods for the population in these areas that relies heavily on natural sources for their livelihood. Slide eight. So as a country, we put in place specific measures to address the climate change impact in these mountains. One, we have our sustainable mountain development strategy, which is a framework for intervention on mountain areas in Uganda. It provides guidance to the management interventions for mountain ecosystems to result in sustainable mountain development in Uganda. It was developed in line with the Mountain Partnership Governance Strategy and in line with the Sustainable Development Goal. The government also has, in support with, in support with uh, the different development partners, we are implementing a number of mitigation and adaptation projects on these mountain areas. And most of these projects, uh, slide, slide, uh, slide nine, most of these projects are geared towards improving the livelihood of the populations in these mountain areas. One of the things about the population in the mountain areas, they're one of the poorest in the country. So the projects are helping them to improve their livelihood. Then we also have um, intervention to demarket, protect, and restore the degraded areas on the mountain. We are also, as a country, recognizing and involving the indigenous people and women in decision-making, women that live on the mountain. There are a number of infrastructure development projects that are taking place on the mountain, basically to improve livelihood and bring services to the people that live on these mountains. We're also doing research. Um, as a country, we are also doing zoning of land use to guide the people that live on these mountains on the different activities that can be done in the different zones. We've also gazetted some of the mountains, especially the higher altitude as protection areas. But some of the lower areas are being degazetted again as farming areas because there was increased conflict between the conservationists and the community that wanted to use some of the protection areas for farming. As a country, we've also put in place facilities to relocate the endangered populations that live on the top of the mountain. We've so far built about 1,000 households houses to, to house the people who are most endangered. And we've bought land to relocate them to practice agriculture in safer areas. I will now talk about slide 10. I'll talk about the challenges that we've experienced while implementing some of these actions. One is that uh, the mountain ecosystems are fragile and vulnerable, so they are basically prone to impacts of climate change. Like I said earlier, these areas have very high population. The average uh, birth rate in, this, in Uganda is 5.6. So there's very high population in these areas, which has contributed to pressure, a lot of pressure on the natural resources, hence degradation of the mountain areas. There's also high levels of poverty and of exploitation of the resources on these mountain areas, which has led to conflicts among the different stakeholders and degradation 
of this the ecosystem. The mountain ecosystems are also costly to develop. Therefore, as a country, we have challenges regarding funding to develop these areas. But like I said earlier, the trans these, most of these mountains are transboundary, and because of that, the different governance regimes in the because like we have mountains between shared between Uganda, Congo, Uganda, Kenya. So you find because of the different governance, the governance structures in the different countries, it contributes to more degradation in these areas. Then also we've had challenges of insecurity in some of the mountains, and this has contributed to degradation and has also affected the livelihood of the communities that live on the mountain. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. I, I'm not sure if I still have minutes left. Uh, thank you, Maureen. You, you do. Are you able to stay for a question and answer session a little later? Uh, like in how long will it be? It'll be in about half an hour's time. We've got about three more presentations and then we're going to... I, I, can, I can call back because I have, I'm nursing a little child. I can't be online all this while. Okay, no problem. I well, can call back in about 20 minutes. Okay, I have one very quick question for you then. Um, is training about yes. climate change and disaster preparedness, fires, drought, floods, for animals compulsory or available for your veterinary animal and animal science officials? Yes. Um, yes, we have training from, from the Office of the Prime Minister that is in charge of, um, of uh, disaster and climate risk in the country. So like I said earlier, we have um, climate change focal persons at the lowest level of a local government. So at this level, we have what they call the Disaster Preparedness Committee, which comprises of the veterinary officer and the agriculture officer. So they are given training in disaster risk reduction. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yes. For that, Maureen, that, that is great. And, and thank you very much for your presentation. I, I think it's a startling statistic that 55% uh, of the Ugandan population is, is 14 or below. And, that's a, a st and obviously the yeah. challenges that climate change is having on the mountainous regions in your beautiful country. So thank you very much for, yeah. for, for that presentation. And now we can- Thank you. Not at all. We're going to move from U Uganda to Nepal, where we have Gabinda Bahadur Shahi of Nepal, who is vice chair of the steering committee of the Mountain Partnership and a board member of, social, of the Social Welfare Council, a regulatory body of the Nepalese government, who has experience working in the community and mountain agendas, focusing climate change along with the promotion of sustainable mountain development, linking to the Sustainable de de Development Goals agenda leave no mountain people behind. Gabinda, over to you. Thank you very much, organizer, uh, for this opportunity. And then I am very sorry that I could not share my presentation then. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you loud and clear. Yeah? Yeah. Just need to get your, and your I am very sorry I could not uh, share my presentation before and I also could not prepare so much because we are so much busy to our social service day that is today. We celebrated our social service day uh, because I am the member of social uh, welfare council in Nepal and then we have to be uh, more engaged on that. So uh, I shortly uh, saw my presentation that is uh, prepared a bit uh, one month before, so you will allow me to uh, present this. Uh, you have given me the topics, usually that is uh, the uh, working animals in the mountains and communities. Especially I am the person from the, the place that is mountain and without the access of road. We don't have access. Uh, there is uh, no road in the uh, uh, place where, from, where, where, from where I am. 
and uh, I am the uh, person from the country with the highest peak in the world, Mount Everest. That's why I would like to wish you all from the highest peak in the world, Mount Everest. And my experience is a bit different from you as we are totally uh, depend on the working animals. That is not only horse and mules. We have goat and ax and others uh, working animals. They do all our things in the mountain. And I cannot, I will not share this. It is already shared by the Yuka because we are from the same network. That is the same data. Uh, usually, I am the advocate especially uh, I do the advocacy of the sustainable mountain development. And I would like to request the people in the world to uh, understand the definition of the mountain. Most of the people in the world, government, government, even UN agencies, they always say that mountain is the difficult and we cannot do the development. That's why the people living in the mountains are the underdeveloped people. But from the perspective of climate change, we are not underdeveloped because we are doing our own that uh, these activities are the uh, usually the climate change adaptation activities that is indigenous skills and knowledge in the mountain. That is why we use the working animals, yaks, mules, horse, goats, they are 100% climate change adaptive activities. We use this and we also uh, take the help of this mountain uh, animals uh, for our livelihoods. And that is the reality of, the, of Nepal, especially to the upper part of the, um, uh, of the country. And nowadays, in the name of development, people say, these people are developed who are living in the big cities. They ride the car. They use the uh, aeroplanes. They use the other uh, fascinated car. They are developed. That's why our understanding and our definition need to be different because the people living in the mountain who are preserving the uh, nature, who are usually depends on the animals, working animals, in the sense of climate change, they are the developed people. People living in the cities, they are not developed. This is my uh, uh, personal thought and personal uh, advocacy. I would like to uh, appeal the people living in the big cities and uh, uh, developed countries, so-called developed countries. Uh, if you see the agenda of the mountain, it is not, it doesn't have a long history but it has just started uh, in a UN systems, not a long time, but there are different uh, resolutions and different discussion, but this is not enough in the, for the mountain peoples and uh, animals, they are really useful for the adaptive livelihoods in the mountain regions or that UN systems and governments of the world they should think and redefine uh, regarding the sustainable mountain development and uh, effect of climate change. If you see in the mountain, the people are happy. They are using the working animals and animals for their livelihoods, for their transportation, for their access to the market, and they are 100% depend on these animals. That's why we have to protect these animals and we have to also advocate on the rights of these animals and rights of the people living in the mountain. Uh, if you see the lifestyles of the mountain people in Nepal, if you see the, uh, especially the houses and other agriculture patterns, they are climate resilience lifestyle and climate resilient adaptive lifestyles. They do and they follow in the mountains. So, but they are defined by the developed country or the people living in the cities. They are defined under developed people. 
That is my questions to the people who are living in the big cities. If you see in the mountain, they are uh, conserving, they are protecting the environment from the traditional family forest. In this family forest, they rear the animals, for example, so horse, goats, and uh, yaks in the mountains. And this type of lifestyle is really the climate change adaptive lifestyles. And we have to advocate and we have to promote this type of livelihood uh, in the whole uh, scenario in the world. If you see, there are no use of machine. There is no use of any other vehicles that will emit the carbon. These climate adaptive agriculture knowledge are in the mountain. So these all are relating to the working animals, not single by the man, but working animals are helping and they are like a family members of the mountain people. So we have to realize and internalize these things and uh, have a programs and policy to protect and promote such type of lifestyles that we can find in the mountain. Not only that, the people living in the mountains, they have limited voices. They don't have the access of the communication. They don't have the access of the uh, development partner. They don't have the access of the other community living in the other parts of the world. That's why our focus should be amplifying their voices and practices that they have been known in the mountain. Uh, so we have to amplify, we have to expand, and we have to show our solidarity. Uh, then we will uh, protect the working animals in the mountains and lifestyles of the people in the mountain. Finally, the sustainable mountain development that is the heart of the world because Already Yuka said, mountain is the tower of fresh water. Mountain is the heart of the, or place of the maintaining the biodiversity. That's why we have to protect these mountains and people living in the mountain. And always you see in UN agenda, reaching the onrys, but people along with the animals in the mountains, they are living behind in the discussion. That's why we have to discuss, we have to uh, advocate for the people living in the mountains and their lifestyle linking to the working animals in the mountain. So this is my campaign do doing in the all over the world. Last time I have done this campaign in the COP and my final version to the people who are living in the world is demanding the urgent action to address the climate change impact in the mountain communities, mountain economies along with the blue economics. People are talking about the blue economics, but we have to talk, we have to focus on the mountain economics that is totally linked with the working animals that I have already said, these different types of working animals in the mountains. Thank you. Gabinda, thank you so much for that passionate sort of overview of the importance of mountains and the importance of working animals and certainly working equids. And Alison um, Rizzo has said, thank you for re redefining mountains for us, Gabinda. I'm feeling inspired and I'm sure it will inspire people to ask questions shortly. So just to remind people about that, please, if you've got questions, then place them in the Q&A function on, on, on Zoom and we'll get to them very shortly. But I'd now like to introduce Jose Galvez, who is an officer in the Climate Change Unit at the Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources in Guatemala, a ministry I know where Wells Welfare part, partner, Sabisa, has worked in the country for some years, especially after the devastating earthquake in 2018. So Jose, over to you. Hello again. Good morning Hi. for us. I don't know what, which time you have. Okay, this is the contents of my presentation. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud, loud and clear. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, second slide, please. Okay. Where is Guatemala located? Uh, maybe you know Guatemala has a tectonic plate, uh, Los Cocos, North America, and the Caribe plate, and we are in the we are in the north of subtropic. We we are above of of uh, the Ecuador, and we have some problems with the with the with the uh, uh, with the weather. Uh, for the, that reason, the uh, all climatic threats like hurricane, El Niño, La Niña, this from the Sahara, uh, all of uh, a warming warming ocean, all of them, uh, they increase. Uh, increase uh, some some weather or some uh, weather in my country. Uh, as you know, we produce uh, zero point zero six percent of uh, greenhouse gases uh, emission, uh, but we are influenced by all the effects of, of uh, and other countries. It was please. Uh, we know that. And as I said that worldwide, uh, that climate change is being accelerated. The increase in the air temperature and caused the greenhouse gases affected my country specifically. Uh, we are some areas with with uh, dry, some areas with uh, all with uh, high uh, high temperature uh, as another emerges. Uh, never, never seen again. Furthermore, if we analyze the problems thoroughly, uh, the methane molecule, I'll thought, it does contribute to the greenhouse effect, decompenses and disappears after about nine years, while CO2 remains in the atmosphere for more than 100 years. In the next in the next uh, uh, slide, you can see uh, the change of the land use from 1972 to uh, 2010, and you can see the increase of uh, urban areas, uh, the uh, coffee plantation, uh, oil oil palm plantation, and they increase uh, all the land use change in in your country. Uh, uh, sugar plantation and uh, they reduce the, the forest area. Guatemala has 31% uh, uh, of forest uh, cover uh, thanks to the fact uh, uh, that they have been declared protected areas. Uh, practically uh, all the country, uh, all the forest country areas uh, we are protected uh, for the council of protected areas here in Guatemala. Next, next slide, please. Uh, you can see the the precipitation, uh, precipitation and evapor trans trans evapor transportation uh, map here. Can you see uh, different areas uh, between uh, is uh, for rain, but you can see the evapor evapor transportation is evapotranspiration is very high and uh, politically some people say that uh, uh, this is a dry corridor but a drought corridor but uh, specifically is uh, uh, named a uh, uh, ecosystem named dry dry forest here in Guatemala but some people uh, talk about about us as a political opportunity to to a uh, get project. The next one, please. Uh, Guatemala has uh, Sierra de las Minas. Uh, is a, a, a from United States come the, uh, the Sierra Madre, and this is uh, all the areas, all the mountain areas in Guatemala, specifically in in middle middle of the country. We have mountain areas. Uh, you can see mainly in the mountain and, and volcanic areas. Uh, this area is specifically or uh, dry forests or or dry dry corridor, as people say. 
repetitively uh, uh, an ecosystem defini defi uh, definite for, for different experts here in Guatemala. Next one, please. <coughs> But will affect uh, the climate change in work animals. Uh, uh, as you know, the animals uh, animals are sensitive to change in temperature uh, as much or more than humans. Uh, if you think now uh, how bad to feel when you have a fever, they also suffer this type of discomfort as a result of climate change. Uh, eventually, uh, they are affected for different uh, uh, different form, uh, extreme droughts, uh, rains and floods, uh, mega storms, disease, extreme extreme heat heat waves. Uh, here in Guatemala, specifically, uh, those animals are very sensitive to climate condition, humidity, temperature, uh, humidity, temperature in which they feel comfortable. But uh, global warming are altering this. This part. Next one, please. As you see, uh, this possible causes causes of uh, this problem. The global warming, global warming directly affect affect working animals. The stress of increasing temperature makes animal needs more water. Uh, food does food does doesn't meet the energy requirement of this of those animals. Uh, some people use uh, those animals more for working, a uh, horse for transportation, uh, or in, in the next case is uh, for, uh, for have fun or for working in different business. The next one, please. Uh, but uh, some animals are well treated here in Guatemala, but uh, due to Due to extreme poverty in some places in Guatemala, they are physically, physically and mentally exploited. Uh, the need of people makes hard work and necessary tool for animal of this of this, this type. You can see some picture about uh, uh, some people use uh, wood for uh, for transportation wood uh, for using. Uh, uh, transportation uh, uh, food for for your house. Next one, please. Uh, uh, working animals such uh, as horses, uh, donkeys, and mules are also used as means of competition. And um, you can see about those uh, Santos Pichumatanes here in Guatemala, specifically in Huehuetenango. Uh, so people use this animal, those animals for, for uh, have some competition, uh, uh, take that dog, I don't know. Next one, please. Uh, but uh, uh, we have an animal welfare unit of the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Food. Uh, this institution was created in 2017 and doesn't have uh, animal records to access or uh, on indic an indicator of this type uh, who calculate uh, which uh, how, how, how many animals is, uh, is uh, try this this way. Uh, next one, please. However, we have the SDGs uh, connected with the objective, objective of uh, Katum 2032. This is the uh, policies focuses on sustainable development here in Guatemala. But uh, some uh, some topics cases with the sustainable the sustainable development goals, and we are trying to connect all all of them uh, to to get better our, our situation here in, in our country. And the last one, uh, uh, okay, if it, uh, this is my presentation from Guatemala. Thanks for your attention. Jose, thank you so much for that and, you know, a, a startling account of the challenges um, in Guatemala, but also the integral role that working animals 
play um, and especially um, the versatility once again of, of working animals and, and their relationship to climate change and the importance but also around sustainable development goals. So I'm sure again people will have questions around the, the Guatemalan perspective shortly and it's great to see questions starting to build up so do please do place them in the Q&A function. Um, okay. We can get to them in a second. So, Jose, thank you. And, and I'd now like to introduce to our last speaker before we go to the Q&A session, which is Ian Causey, Director of Policy, Advocacy and Campaigns at our partner, the Donkey Sanctuary, and will talk to us about working animals and disaster preparedness. Um, Ian, over to you. Rolling and distinguished fellow panellists, it's fantastic to be able to speak with you today at uh, New York Climate Week and many thanks to all of you who are watching the stream of this side event. We've already had some great presentations and I want to follow them with a few words about working animals. Their importance not just to mountain communities but many other communities in the world as well. Why their welfare is important and why more needs to be done to protect them from the climatic events that are all too frequently occurring and will continue to do so unless the governments of the world take urgent action. And now I'm going to take a leap of faith now and try to share my screen. Any of my team who are watching now will be holding their breath. I think that's there now. Good. So there's the header. For those of you who don't know, the Donkey Sanctuary is the world's largest equine charity. And uh, whilst we do have sanctuaries that care for thousands of donkeys and mules, as you can see, both large and small, we also work internationally to help to improve the health and welfare of donkeys and mules in the field, many of whom are the working animals that are key to the communities they are part of. And in doing this work, we have many great partners and we are delighted to be doing this event with our friends at World Horse Welfare. Between us, we are two of the four organizations that make up the International Coalition for Work in Equids, the others being Brook and Sparna. And it is the sum of our efforts that can help us reach as many working donkeys, horses and mules as we possibly can. And this is a shot of us in New York last year at the UN when it was safer to be there, uh, where we literally brought donkeys, horses and mules to the centre of New York. Well, not literally, but we did in, in spirit. And we got to meet NGOs, we got to meet diplomats, we got to meet UN departments. We even got to meet the New York Police Department to explain the importance of these brilliant animals. So as you can see on these images, lots of donkeys doing lots of work in lots of parts of the world, lots of these images will be very, very familiar to you. And they show the key role they and other working animals play in sustaining the communities they are part of. And in helping these animals, there is the double win that this will help the communities they are part of. Where working animals are well cared for and have good health and welfare, then this can help support better livelihoods, better food production, open up access to markets, as well as access to clean and safe water. And the income working animals generate can aid gender empowerment and help get more children into education. Work in equids, particularly donkeys and mules, can adapt to difficult terrains and challenging environmental adversities. And um, these mules here are literally firefighters. They are taking firefighter equipment to locations where other forms of traction would struggle to do so. And in these challenging situations, their low input traction power can be key to successful sustainable agriculture, just as one example. And comparative studies of forestry management have proven that animal traction dramatically halves the percentage of damaged trees compared to machine traction. So in some parts of the world, working animals are not only a much needed option, they are also an option that can be more in harmony with the environment they work and live in. Of course, animals are also produced for human consumption. With donkeys, whilst it can be for meat and dairy, it is often for their skin. In many cases, this is to supply the traditional Chinese medicine industry, 
though it can be for leather as well. But this is such a waste of such a productive asset. Last year, a United Nations Environment Programme news release warned that the sixth mass species extinction is on the cards and donkeys were given a particular mention. Talking about donkeys being killed for leather, they concluded, the unsustainable extraction of a resource, whether it's donkeys, plants, trees or minerals, can have adverse effects on the environment and communities in distant lands. In the case of donkeys, a valuable mode of all weather carbon neutral transport is removed from those most in need of transport in remote settings. In simple terms, donkeys are worth more when they are well cared for and working in their communities, such as mountain regions, rather than being killed for their parts. And this ability to work in harmony with the environment is why working animals need greater recognition and be integrated into the sustainable solutions we need to create, both to mitigate climate change, but also in disaster preparedness. Where communities lose their infrastructure and are isolated, it is often donkeys and mules that get essential aid and support to those in need. Floods in Pakistan in 2010 killed 1,600 people and left 2 million homeless. Millions of dollars were donated in aid, and in many locations, the terrible ground conditions meant that it was donkeys that ensured the supplies reached those in desperate need. And once the crisis has passed, the speed of recovery is enhanced where the working animals have been protected and can play their role in getting life back to some kind of normality. But donkeys, horses and mules and other animals are not immune to climate change and their needs should be part of disaster planning, yet really are. And this is not just the case in mountain regions or in certain parts of the world, it's pretty much everywhere. Indeed, in the US, when New Orleans flooded a few years ago, the mayor gave the order to evacuate to locations of safe refuge and a comprehensive disaster plan swept into action. Yet when families arrived with their precious belongings they wanted to protect, including their animals, they were told there were no facilities for animals. They were told to go home, make their animals as safe as possible, and head back to the refuge. Of course, what many did was head home and stay home. They were not going to leave their animals. Look at this picture. He's not going to let go, is he? And neither would I. Although, as I have five dogs, I'm not quite sure what juggling act I'd have to perform to protect them. And we see similar stories like this everywhere across the world. So the lack of provision to protect animals meant that in the end, this inadequate planning put humans and animals at risk. And the UN has acknowledged this link. Priority three from the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction sets out the importance of investing in disaster re risk reduction for resilience and specifically calls for the protection of livelihoods and protect productive assets including livestock, working animals, tools and seeds. So building on that, what are the actions that need to happen if people in the mountain regions and other parts of the world that rely on working animals are going to live more resilient, sustainable, safer lives? Well, there needs to be better integration of the issues and responses to the challenges being faced. You cannot deal with them in isolation. And so that means considering animals as well as humans. The protection of working animals previously acknowledged by the UN now needs to appear in the disaster planning of governments, international institutions and local authorities and be backed by the necessary funding. Policies related to uh, development programming and environmental crisis management should include working animal inclusive language and should be referenced in SDG voluntary national reviews. And when people are displaced following climatic events, 
that there are adequate facilities in provision in refugee and IDB camps for their working animals to enable a speedier transition back to their communities and to their lives. And this is not about sentimentality for animals. It is about safeguarding critical livelihood assets which can sustain independence. Now, this is a challenging agenda, but it is achievable. And often, it is more that the role of working animals are just not thought of, rather than any decision not to include them. So there is something we can all do today to start to change that. At the HLPF in July, we launched a Working Animal Alliance to address climate change, public health issues, and to achieve the SDGs. You're all welcome to sign up. This is an informal group of stakeholders who we can keep informed of our work and a forum where we can help each other. For example, we can assist with the wording for countries when they prepare their voluntary national reviews to show what can be done towards achieving the SDGs by improving the health and welfare of working animals. We can share the latest news and research around working animals and the lives they positively affect. We can discuss how to participate and influence those key events discussing the road to a sustainable future. And we are aiming to produce a report on working animals to be considered as part of the midterm review of the SDGs in 2023. Hopefully, on this Zoom page, you will be able to see and download our concept note for the Alliance, our brochure on working animals and climate change, and our ideas on how member states can protect and enhance their working animals by including them in their VNRs. Please download and please let us know what you think. And it would be good to hear from you about how we can work together. Because there is only one planet and things have to change if we want future generations to be able to live sustainably on it. And that's as true for animals as it is for us. Thank you for listening and thank you all for your interest in our work. Ian, thank you so much for a great um, overview of the Working Animal Alliance. I was reminded in your new New Orleans photo of the, the old military thing, prior planning and preparation prevents poor performance. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a great example of it. You can do all the planning, but if you don't think of the important assets like working animals or animals full stop, then there is going to be great trouble. So thank you for that, for a fascinating overview from across the globe on the impacts of climate change and mountain regions and how crucially working animals are helping to mitigate this. So if I could ask uh, our panelists to uh, turn back on their videos if they can. Um, before we head to the, uh, uh, the, the Q&A session, and we've got over half an hour for questions, which is brilliant, um, we've got a quick poll for you. Um, where people believe, um, just asking about what you believe the importance of working animals are in mitigating climate change. So whether you believe the use of working animals can play a role in that. So that um, um, poll is now up there live. Can working animals play a role in mitigating climate change? Very simple, yes, no, uh, not sure. Certainly no correct answers. We just wanted to get a feel for, for, for those who, who are listening in. So now we're going to move on to the Q&As and thank you very much to everyone who's put those in. Let's, um, um, we'll, we'll kick off with a one for, for Yuka um, and it's coming from Roger. He said, I wonder if developing an export orient um, I want sorry. I wonder if developing an export or in, orientated production system undermines the idea of food self sufficiency and resilience. Would a more collective approach keep things local, perhaps? Yuka. I really appreciate that question. Thank you very much for that question because, as you know, if you work in mountain areas, the community production is very very small. So, the dream of export maybe 20, 30 years down the line. But to have that goal in mind where we can have enough production that we're both self-sufficient, can supply the local market, and then the market in the country, perhaps the regional market, it's just a long-term goal. But first and foremost, it definitely is about community coming together, working together to be able to produce the quantity and the quality. It's very difficult in mountains. I mean, some of our products that we have in Nepal, people walk three days to the nearest market. 
So having to build that value chain at the local level is a very long and difficult process. So definitely we have to work at the local level and secure that market because it's not just production, it's the labeling, it's the packaging, it's the market distribution system, it's the whole gamut of things that we need to do. So definitely it starts with the community and that's what the participatory guarantee system is, where the communities themselves, if you have people flying in from abroad and certifying your product as organic, it costs a lot of money, which can't be afforded by the local community. They would never see that amount of money, which can be from $5,000 to $10,000 ever in their lifetime. So the participatory guarantee system helps the communities guarantee their own product. So we definitely want to start locally and with the community coordination. Yuka, thank you very much uh, for that great answer. And obviously, you know, you've talked a lot about partnership and it's lovely to see some, some offers of partnership coming through on, on the chat and the Q&As as well. Just to, um, Ian mentioned during his presentation three documents which have now been put up on uh, the chat function. So please do go uh, and look at those and be, be able to download the uh, documents that um, Ian referred to. Now, now, may I just add the, something to that, if I may? Yes, you can. Yes, go ahead. Uh, because we're talking about collaboration coordination, this effort is helped by IFOAM, who is the International Organic Certifying Agency, Slow Food, that helps on the ground with their Slow Food partners, and also with um, uh, Naturasi, who is an organic uh, marketing company who knows how to market uh, and distribute across regions and countries. And so this is definitely not done by one organization alone. And it's a collaboration of different organizations who know what they're doing. So that's a great effort together. Absolutely, and very much at the heart of what the Working Animal Alliance is about as well. So we're gonna help signpost that. So thank you to those who have answered the poll, hopefully with a bit of technology wizardry will be able to give you an answer to the poll well now if you're a researcher you would say this is a skewed audience but I'm, I'm delighted to see that the vast majority uh, almost nine in ten of us uh, have um, said yes working animals uh, do play a role in mitigating climate change it's great to see and obviously I mean and, and absolutely if people don't know that's part of the reason today is all about is to try and get people to have a greater understanding of the importance of, of working animals so thank you so much for that now I was going to go a question for uh, Gabinda Gabinda um, a question from Sean you have shared your personal knowledge of how working animals are beautifully integrated into the life of mountain communities in Nepal and represent an essential and fundamental role in sustaining these people. How would you suggest promoting the invaluable contribution these animals provide among policymakers and global players to ensure these realities are adequately protected? Thank you very much for these questions. <clears throat> yeah, as you know, the life of the people living in the mountains, uh, they are living in the nature. Usually, this is my experience, my livelihood experience, and it's still now. And my uh, relatives and families are in the same conditions. This is my personal experiences, and we don't have. I have already mentioned that we don't have the access of uh, other vehicles and roads and other modern uh, things for that. But if you see the happiness indicators of the my village. This is more, more, more than the people living in the cities. If you see the happiness indicators, they are dirty. They are working with the mud. They are working in the mountain, in the cliffs, but they are so happy. They are playing with the working animal in the mountain. These working animals are like a family members of these people living in the mountain. But if you share this picture to the people living in the cities or in the developed countries. They said, oh, poor people. So poor people living in these uh, uh, conditions. They have some sympathy. That's why we have to realize or internalize these people who are in the policy maker or who are living in the developed country, so-called developed country, that in the perspective of the climate change adaptations, the life adapting uh, by the people living in the mountain is the correct. That is the sustainable way. But we will improvise 
somehow, for example, some cultures, some bad practices, that mild practices, we have to aware the people living in the mountain. And we have to focus our policy uh, to protect their lives and to sustain their practices, indigenous practices, not to divert their practices and bring them to the cities and uh, promote them to construct the big building and buy the cars and sell their lands in the mountains and sell their animals in the mountains and come to the cities and then uh, enjoy others' uh, pizza. Policy makers, they should focus to the investment to the mountains yeah. and then create the environment so that the people in the mountain can live in the same place but do not migrate to other places because of some health facilities, education facilities. They only live for the health facilities and education facilities, but they are. So if you, the policy maker, they create that right of environment to provide the education systems and health system in the mountain, and they will be happy and they will uh, sustain their life in the mountain. That's why we have to influence uh, in such a way to the world leaders, policymakers. That is my experiences. Thank you very much, Gabir. Yeah. That is so, so true yeah. that, that investment is, is vital. Um, Jose, a question for you from Amy. What would the impact be if Guatemala lost its working equids? But uh, uh, the problem here in Guatemala is uh, a great level of uh, poverty here. Some people uh, cannot uh, sustainably uh, uh, their akins uh, as uh, horses, mules, or or donkeys, uh, because uh, uh, they think is uh, they thought is is uh, very very expensive to to the maintenance of this uh, this kind of animals specifically uh, the rural areas here in Guatemala. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good tool to have a, a working animal, but uh, specifically here in Guatemala, uh, some people uh, lost or animals uh, as uh, uh, they, they uh, boil uh, their animals because uh, they need get money for uh, for uh, live here in Guatemala. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for that, Jose. Um, question for Tamara: um, With increasing vulnerability from climate change, how do you think working mules and livelihoods will be affected across the different sectors? Good question. Um, well, I at least here in Chile, for example, last year we had a really, really dry summer and we're seeing this more often. And um, we currently have a water deficit in most of the country, even in the south where we usually have more rain. So this means that, for example, these people that have to move their cattle up to the mountains during summer, now they have to do it earlier in the year. So they have to stay up in the mountains for a longer period. That means being away from their families. It means having better uh, equipment that can actually stay longer up in the mountains. And we are seeing how uh, the production is in going up in altitude. Farms are moving up, and at the same time they're moving south. So if a couple of years ago, it wasn't very usual to see, for example, a donkey in the south of the country. Now you're starting to see them. Now you're starting to have um, wine yards in the south, which are usually here in the central area of the country. So this means that people that maybe were used to work with oxen now are changing to horses. And that means that we need to do a lot of education because if you don't have the abilities or if you have never been in contact with a mule, it's difficult to handle it. So we need to, to start training people and changing some of the methods that were used before. 
Um, till is very long, so we have from the desert uh, down to Punta Arenas, which is very cold. So we are seeing this movement of animals. We're also seeing this uh, presence of diseases that maybe we didn't have before. Um, for example, we don't see ticks, which I don't like at all, ticks in the south of the country because of the uh, weather. And now we're starting to see that, for example, ticks are moving down. And that, that means that we have to do a vigilance of different kinds of disease, that they can affect other animals, that we can have new species. Uh, and the same with the um, forage for the animals. Everything is changing, so we need to kind of move with that change and prepare uh, the community so they can actually be prepared for this new scenario. Yes. Tamara, thank you. Um, then just turning to Zhao, of the question, of, you talked about the benefits of abandonment and rewilding, but there are there negative impacts of less farming and less people living in rural areas? Hi, um, yes, of course, one of, one of those is, is the fire, uh, as I tried to, to explain. With, with less people in, in the countryside, in, in rural areas, uh, and doing less uh, farming, there's changes in, the, in the, the fuel distribution and fuel loads and the fuel connectivity in the landscape, which increases the, the, the risk of large fires and intensive fire events. So that, that's one of the, the major consequences of removing people from rural areas. So the, the landscape becomes dominated by um, flammable, uh, heavy loaded fuel ecosystems in a continu continuously, especially uh, in, the, in the landscape. So that creates conditions for dramatic fire events. But there's other uh, negative consequences as well. Um, the landscape with less farming uh, decreases uh, scenery value, that's one, one thing. Other cultural ecosystem services uh, uh, that might lose, might be lost, are related to traditional knowledge and, and the, some part of the biodiversity. I, I, I focus on, on wild biodiversity, but there's one part of biodiversity that you, you are aware of, it's domesticated biodiversity that tends to to be lost when you decrease, uh, when you reduce uh, farming and farming activities in, in, in the landscape. Um, and that includes um, the donkeys and, and horses that will tend to be, to be lost if there is no use for, for these, these breeds in, in, in mountain and other areas. And so I would say to answer this question that there are several um, um, negative consequences of less people, less farming in, in the landscape, especially uh, within what we call cultural ecosystem services, including also domesticated uh, diversity. But my, my focus, uh, the focus of my presentation was um, on the opportunities that landscape change creates because uh, you cannot do much about landscape change. This is, it's moving in that direction and you, you can uh, try to, to avoid some of the, the, the most negative effects of this kind of, of landscape change, but you cannot stop it. Yeah. You can, you, can um, you know, try to, to find solutions for more serious types of changes, but you cannot change it. But on the other hand, there's opportunities being created by, by this landscape change. And so I tend to, when I talk to, to people, I tend to put the, the emphasis of my, my message on the opportunities that this kind of landscape change uh, gives to, to local communities. Brilliant, thank you, Jean. Um, Ian, now you reference donkeys as being carbon neutral and obviously it's well recognised that equines emit a fraction of methane of, of ruminants. Um, would, and with, with methane it has about 25 times the global warming effect of carbon dioxide. Could advocates for working equids attract climate activists' attention to greater, greater mutual benefit, keeping equids alive and working and possibly not consumed? Yes, I think that's right, Roly. And actually, I think the great thing about the uh, 
uh, UN Environment Programme report uh, last year on, on the uh, danger of the sixth mass species extinction was that was the very much the point that they were making. And, it, uh, and so what we see across the world at the moment is millions of donkeys being killed every year to, to, for, the, for the skins and then to go into things like the traditional Chinese medicine market. Uh, and actually the real issue is here is this is something that can be so productive and so good for communities across the world. Uh, and it's almost like just a poor use of a resource. Uh, and of course, we're always looking for partners. You know, I mean, perhaps even a year ago, I doubt very much that we would have been here at a climate change event. Uh, the more we look at the sustainable world, way people are trying to live, the more we're looking at those global solutions, the more we can see that there are linkages and they're not always the obvious ones. And so you know, thinking about what is it that helps people live sustainable lives? What is it that helps them keep low carbon outputs and what is it that means that we make uh, the most of, of living in harmony with animals that can actually work with us. I think donkeys and horses and mules are right at the very top of that uh, and I hope that these sorts of events will bring people from who are looking at different things from different into one similar place which is actually we can all help each other here to have a sustainable future. Thank you Ian, it'd be really interesting actually if, if anyone's got any um insight into research that's been carried around, you know, equids being carbon neutral. Um, Ian, I'll start with you, but then across the panellists, you know, a very simple but direct and relevant question, how can we measure or best measure the carbon impact outputs of horses and donkeys and mules? Well, I think there's further work to be done on that. And, you know, one of the things that we're hoping to do uh, with the donkey sanctuary over the uh, uh, the next period of time is to start to think about what are the programs and research we need to set up to help to bring data to the table to improve the understanding of how all of these things interact and we're and we'll be doing that with a number of partners a number of ngos and governments and people who can see the benefit of what we're trying to create here um i mean, I mean it was of great heart to me that uh, that the un environmental program were, were willing to say this and to to put their name on the stamp of carbon neutral donkeys but but you know i think what the real issue here is how do we look at what has to happen in communities in different parts of the world and all the things that contribute to a sustainable lifestyle and all of the things that means that people have good livelihoods and at the right amount of fuel and the ability to have some sort of decent lifestyle and i actually think that uh, by working with partners some of the people in this room are here today and some others it's an exciting time for this development, this work, and I look forward to us uh, working together in the future. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, Felix is quite rightly uh, picking me up on some of my terminology, which I'll correct in a second. <laughs> um, Yuka, um, we have seen mountains matter probably even more than we thought. Um, the same goes for working animals. How would you envision ensuring a strong cooperation across sectors to tackle urgent issues relating to environmental crises affecting the regions we've discussed? Thank you. <coughs> I think there are two things. One is the coordination that the Mountain Partnership does, and one thing is on the ground. So to talk first about the coordination that Mountain Partnership does, we do four areas of work. One is advocacy. So at the UN General Assembly, the Mountain Partnership, we produce every two years, or two or three years, a report to the, General, to the Secretary General of the United Nations on the progress that we have made in mountain development. Another thing we do is we monitor, as I mentioned earlier, we have the Sustainable Development Goal 15.4.2, which covers mountains. And we're responsible every three years to submit to the Director General, or the Secretary General, the progress of mountain green cover around the globe. And that is actually today, uh, tomorrow, it's being submitted. So every few years, we're responsible for monitoring that. And so at global level, that's that. We do capacity development. We do training on agrobiodiversity in mountains, which is go going as I speak. We also have a new training that's gonna start in end of September, that's last next week on climate change in mountains. And this is open to anybody around the world. And we are, we started with English, now we're also trying to do Spanish. And our goal is to finally have it in Russian as well, so we can address different communities around the globe. And one of the key things that I want to bring up, we also do knowledge sharing. And as our members, we have a scientific community, 
And UL is also part of the scientific community where we try to do data analysis of mountain communities. It's very difficult to find mountain specific data. And so we have different partners that are working on. One of our partners, the Mountain MRI Research and Institute, they just worked on collaboration of high mountain, um, IPCC report and high mountains that was just published last year. And so we have the scientific community that's helping us. And then we have this joint action at the global level. And I'm very, to have, very happy to announce that Donkey Sanctuary just recently joined a mountain partnership. So we are part of this, and that's why I'm here, because of the kind invitation of Donkey Sanctuary. So this global action at the global level. And um, that's one thing. Another thing we do is on the ground. And so because we have 402 members, our, our members are involved from livelihoods to science to universities to the whole gamut of different activities on the ground and in the countries. And we have regional constituencies that work together. And that I think is important because a single organization is not an expert on everything. Yeah. And so when we have our constituency in the Latin America region, they work together. And uh, our job is to bring those constituencies together. We have a great um, work, piece of work, for example, in activities done by our members in Kyrgyzstan, for example, where we're bringing together producers of um, silk and felt scarves. And so we, we help in bringing these producers together on the ground. And so there come scarves to animals to everything. And that's how we work to bring them together on the ground as well as the global level. Brilliant. Thank you, Yuka. Uh, Tamara, a um, question around one welfare, and obviously you gave a wonderful presentation on how well integrated the use of working animals are in the lives of the mountainous communities in Chile. How would you encourage countries to replicate such examples according to their specific needs in, in order to make sure no one is left behind? And what do you think are the main motivators and strategies that should be put in place? Um, if you can answer that in 30 seconds, you'll be doing very well. <laughs> We could talk all day about that. Um, I think first we need societies to recognize the, the, all the contributions that working experts have for the community and for livelihoods. And that means recognizing their direct contributions such as income generation, but also the, the indirect ones, gender equality, resilience, and once we have the community aware of the importance of these animals for the people, then I think we can move to a national strategy. And that needs for us to get the government to recognize working equity within the laws and all the public policies. And that I think at least in Chile has been difficult because they, they are not considered pets and they are not considered productive animals. So they are kind of in this between and left out of all uh, public policies. Uh, maybe one first step would be to implement the OIE uh, chapter on working equity welfare and kind of bring it down to local necessities and develop some regulations so we can uh, somehow be able to regulate the use of working equipment, but also to ensure their protection, their welfare. And then uh, I think the one welfare approach is, is actually very visible with working equipment because we have, um, for example, in the city, people that work with horses, if they don't have their horses, they don't have an income. If they work, they have an income and they can provide, for example, better um, hay or food stuff for their animals and go and have access to, uh, to the vet. If they don't have a daily income, they can't do that. So it's kind of a cycle. Uh, the horse is important for the welfare of the family and the welfare of the family is important for the welfare of the, of the horse and, and the environment. So, but this needs <clears throat> probably um, more research. I think there is li little research done in working equity, not only in the, for example, the, the, the impact on climate change directly, or their, but we don't have much information about their economic contribution to countries. It, it is probably much more difficult to measure than the contribution of 
copper or wine in the case of, or the salmon industry in the case of Chile. But uh, we also need, at, at least here we have seen that there is, um, there are some aspects of people that are important to work on. For example, empathy. Uh, we have seen that empathy can somehow um, explain much more of the welfare of the animals than the socioeconomic status. Yeah. So if we can somehow uh, start with education, with ch children at school being able to, to see the importance of these animals, we can, we can make a, a change in how they see them in the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. But there are so many examples um, on how you can in integrate horses or donkeys or mules to have this one foot welfare approach. But first, I think we need governments to recognize the importance of this animal. Hence, because that's the only way to, yeah. to have regulations and public policies. Thank you, Tamara. And of course, that's what the Working Animal Alliance is, is all about and really to get, because that is the, 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 what we so badly needed. Um, Felix quite rightly picked me up on the, when I'm talking about carbon neutral, but in relation to methane, obviously we're talking to greenhouse gases. And, and actually, Cara has, uh, has re referenced a very good point here, saying we need to be careful of framing donkeys and mules as carbon neutral, because donkeys and mules work in some of the most high polluting and environmentally impactful industries such as brick kilns, construction and mining and, and picking up on Tamara's point there, more research is needed. So yeah, research is clearly just so important. Ian, is there a point you want to make on that? Yes, of course. Um, uh, and, and, and just because you exactly that point, it was just because you have something that is low carbon or carbon neutral, that, that doesn't mean that uh, an entire industry becomes it. Uh, so, you know, just be careful not to make any suggestion that is interesting enough the the information that we've looked at on this which uh, to try and back up the, the words that the UN environment program was saying it does show that working equids are it's working equids where there can be uh, low carbon carbon neutrality and actually it's, it's when donkeys are farmed that's not the case so there's an interesting differentiation there and again goes back to my point that Donkeys are perhaps better used in, uh, to support communities rather than being farmed. Brilliant, thank you. And, and actually, Joe Collins has put up a very good in the chat function there. You'll see a link to um, an article in Equine Veterinary Science, which explores the equine contribution and methane emission and its mitigation strategies. So do go and take a look at that. Um, Jose, a question here, a very direct, simple question. Is tourism a good thing for mountain people and their working equids? Yeah, here in Guatemala, is, uh, is some people use the, the, the horses to, to take a trip around the mountains. Uh, specifically in the uh, coffee areas, uh, they using horses to take a trip with uh, uh, with people to arrive to the, the coffee farms, and they to the people and and bring uh, around the, the the crop of coffee as a tourist. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Zhao, a question for you. As a researcher and based on your experience, would you encourage the inclusion of animal traction and the use of working equids into relevant policies as a tool for sustainable agroforestry management and as a way to prevent landscape change, soil degradation and erosion? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, animal, working animals, they can play an important role in the management of, of the landscape, like the, the things that uh, I mentioned before that should be avoided, like continuity of fuels in, in, the, the, in, in, in the landscape. That can be prevented with, with animals, with more um, in interaction with vegetation through grazing or stepping or just using animals to, to some, some sort of uh, clearing of vegetation. But I see the role of uh, working animals mostly in, in forestry because, and related to, to forest fires because the, in, the, in forest fire prevention, it's, it's essential to 
you know, to manage vegetation in places where machines cannot reach. And I'm, I'm, since we are talking about mountains, most of, of the slopes in mountains are, are very steep, so machines do not cannot go there. But but horses and and mules and donkeys they they can do that, and so they they can become a uh, uh, fundamental part of this management of of this forests, also sensitive sites, sensitive not just for conservation reasons, but also for soil conservation re uh, reasons. Uh, animals can have, can, can uh, be used for the management of these sites and reduce the fuel loads to prevent fires. And another thing is that um, Forestry, usually in forestry, usually we say that the use of biomass for energy, for instance, is a carbon neutral activity, which is not totally accurate because we still use um, uh, fossil fuels to extract, to harvest, and to transport biomass. And but if we if we add uh, working animals in this equation, this activity and other activities related to forests might become truly. Um, and um, carbon neutral. So I see um, very good opportunities in terms of management of landscapes, especially from this perspective of fire uh, risk reduction in, in mountain areas. Um, but this has to be a sustainable system and for that public policy needs to, to give a, a push. And sometimes that's what it, it, it takes, just a, a, little, uh, a little help to start things becoming uh, functional and sustainable. Thank you, Zhao. And just picking up on that point of public policy, this I think unfortunately is going to be the last question, but I'm very good to briefly come to the panelists just to see their take home message from today's wonderful session. But you could just a question what are the main aspects that have hindered the recognition of mountain environments in national government policies? I think this, of course, depends on every country situation, but I think there are three main things. One is the population in mountains are small, and not only that, they're dispersed. So the power of their voice is much limited compared to the lower plains where the population is more dense. Number two, because of that, they tend to be poorer. So economically, they're not seen as important in a lot of countries. And number three, it's also their distance from city centers and markets. I just mentioned in Nepal, for example, some people have to walk three days to the market. And so their distance makes them unreachable or hard to access, therefore they're considered less important. And I think those are the key main reasons in many countries that cause that. Brilliant, thank you Yuka for that wonderfully concise but very informative answer. We're nearly coming up to time, so what I'd just love to do at the end now is just come to each of our panellists and say, what it, having heard our rich discussion, what, what's the take home message for you? So Gabinda, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll come to, to you first. Um, what is the take home message from today's discussion for you? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, especially I have also learned from the different countries experiences and that has also I feel that that's the same as Nepal because uh, uh, working animals and the life of the people living in the mountains is so much connected. That's why uh, we as being an advocate, advocator, uh, we need to speak on this spirit all over the world and in policy levels, as well as in our daily practices, we have to uh, keep this in mind, this message that working animals and then the human beings lives, especially in the mountain is very close, uh, interrelated and they are also environmental friendly and adaptive uh, things. Wonderful. Binda, thank you for that. Um, yeah, what, what's your take home message? Well, from what I've learned today, I would say that working animals are key elements in mountain um, social ecological systems, uh, contributing strongly to, to sustainability and to meet the sustainable de development goals. And also, then this is from my perspective, uh, uh, um, the supply of several types of ecosystem services. Absolutely, thank you, Zhao. Jose, for you, what, what's your take-home message? Oh, please. 
It's, it's very important for us uh, to take uh, context about uh, uh, this animal work. In, uh, some people here in Guatemala are using, as I said before, some people using the uh, dolphin animal to, to tourists. Uh, I, I forgot to mention it uh, to people using uh, moles or, or for donkeys to climb volcanoes as uh, uh, Volcan de Agua, as uh, Volcano of uh, the Fuego, uh, of uh, Acatenango. They're using those animals and, uh, and they uh, uh, they uh, uh, live with this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, money uh, when they get uh, this money from tourist people uh, to climb this kind of of uh, of tourists. Uh, of course, uh, they using in in around, around the, the country uh, for uh, working, for transportation, for uh, uh, forget uh, uh, any animal of forces. Uh, but uh, it's a good point for uh, for getting information about another countries uh, as Chile, Tamara. Uh, uh, she says some something important for for all the countries to to the contribu contribution of this uh, this kind of animals to to the to the development of of, of the country, especially of the poor people in 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 the the mountain areas. Jose, thank you. Tomorrow, I'm just seeing a question, a comment from Gerardo saying, if the one responsible for their health and welfare, the veterinary sector needs to be on board with the challenges on climate change. That, that, that's so true. Um, what, what are your final thoughts? I think um, still people can't imagine um, the number of activities in which working equities are involved in the world. Uh, there are so many different cultural, traditional, different types of work that we need to make working equity, their caretakers and their contributions visible. And not only visible for the government, for, but also for the society. So they can, they can actually see how important they, they are for so many people. Um, I think that would be my, my, my take home message and get some policies done <laughs> in every country. Tamara, thank you very much. Uh, and Tony, to, to one of our hosts, the Donkey Sanctuary, Ian, what, what are your final thoughts? Well, I think, Roly, that uh, you know, in this complex world where we're trying to find the sustainable living solutions for everyone, that actually when it comes to mountain regions and mountain, the mountain partnerships really, really important. And uh, working equids and working animals are also key to it. And when they're well cared for, it's better. And the real take home message from today is we've just found a whole new bunch of friends and partners that we can do work together with this on. Thank you. Um, and I'll turn to another of our hosts, uh, Yuka, um, with the FAO. Your final thoughts. Thank you. I think it's best to repeat my last slide of my presentation was a call to action that I think the presentations today really showed how much we really need to ensure that we have focus of um, investments. A comprehensive approach, looking at animals, the livelihoods, as well as environment in mountain regions, and that we all need to work together to increase investments, as well as ensure that policy and they're given visibility at the government and policy level, so at all levels. And uh, I think we're all doing our part, and now we can work together, as uh, Ian just mentioned, as a partnership and make this happen. Brilliant. Well, listen, thank you to, to you, Yuka, to Tamara, to Zhao, to Maureen, to Gabinda, to Jose and to Ian for your excellent contributions today. And it really, I hope it's opened all of our minds about the importance of working animals and how they, they have a vital role they, they play and will need to play to address climate change and environmental disasters. And we've had sort of many common themes around education, around research, around the relevance of the sustainable development goals that have really intertwined and um, all of our presentations. So thank you so much to our, our panelists. Thank you to everyone for joining us, whether you're joining us live or you're, you're on the playback. Um, we'll just let you know that the YouTube link will be uh, forwarded to you tomorrow so you'll be able to share that widely and I'm, I, I really implore you to share uh, today's discussion so you can other people can benefit from the extraordinary contributions we've had from our panelists um, so thank you very much for joining us I hope you have a, a, a very enjoyable 
and productive rest of Climate Week. Um, and we look forward to seeing you very soon when we do another one of our webinars. But in the meantime, in this very challenging world we live in, take care and thank you. Thank you.